Hey, Roy, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks very much. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you here. So uh, for the folks who don't yet know what, what Babel Bark is, uh, let's start there. What's your company do? So Bubblebark is a, a software platform. It's actually the world's only technology platform that connects the whole pet ecosystem in one place. Think of it a little bit like Expedia, where Expedia kind of connects your flights, your hotels, your rental cars, your restaurants, all in one place for holistic experience. For Bubblebark does the same for the pet world. So we connect the shelters, the groomers, the workers, the trainers, the nutritionists, the veterinarians, the food you buy, the medications you take, the activities the dog does, everything in one place. Okay, cool. And so your ideal customer, I'm guessing, is a pet owner or is it a subset? Is it a certain type of pet owner that's your ideal customer? So we kind of, uh, um, our ideal customers are split into three. So from the pet parent perspective, I would say it's mostly millennials and je- pet uh, Gen Zs. So people mm-hmm. in their, you know, mid thirties and below who are more technology focused mm-hmm. and are more accustomed or like to using technology across every aspect of their life. From the pet services, it's basically the same age group and same demographics. The fact that they are actually trainers or groomers or walkers, they they still behave and act in the same way because in the same age bracket and same kind of technology enabled mindset. Okay. On the on the vet side, I would say it's all vets, especially over the last several weeks. You know, when the COVID-19 epidemic, the, the whole need for connected care, for remote patient monitoring, for teleservices, be it telemedicine or telehealth or tele whatever, has, you know, come up in a very big way. And that's exactly what we enable. Okay. What does the pricing model look like? So we have three different um, subscriptions. The pet parent pay, there's a basic free app that the pet parent uh, can download and use. Um, we have, you know, a ton of those, over 300 people on the platform already. And then there's a paid version. Think of Amazon like Amazon Prime. So we have a Bubblebuck Prime uh, version. We call it Alpha Pack. That costs two and a half dollars a month. And that provides you with an unlimited amount of uh, veterinary support hotline uh, provided with our partner and found services, um, all those kind of goodies. The pet businesses, groomers, workers, trainers, for a cloud-based portal that enables them to do cloud-based client management, online marketing, online payments, connection with their okay, clients, online scheduling, all that kind of stuff. It costs them a whopping $29 a month flat fee per business, regardless of how many clients and how many employees they have. The veterinarians, they pay between 129 to 199 flat fee a month, no additional payments, no bells and whistles. And that's according to the level of integration with their practice management system and the level of telemedicine that they want to enable through the platform. Okay. So what does that boil down to in an average price per user, do you know? So again, I mean, a pet parent pays two and a half dollars a month. A clinic, I would say, on average, pays about $140 a month, and a pet business is only $29 a month. Yeah, but um, what I was wondering is if you took all of those different types of users and you just said, well, we've got, you know, 5000 ah, got it. Got it. Revenue, yeah. what does it equate on average? About $54 per pet per year. Okay. What year did you launch? We started the company uh, five years ago. Uh, we came up with the idea in November of 14. We incorporated in June of 15. And we were kind of in semi-stealth mode, you know, building it quietly. And then we launched our production level products in January of 19, a year and a half ago. Since then, we've uh, had a um, pretty amazing success, if I may be, you know, if I can say so, and I apologize if it sounds a little bit arrogant, but but we have about 300,000 pets on the platform already. We have about 900 pet businesses and over 300 clinics, and we're growing at a very fast rate. That's fantastic. So you were coding for four years? Well, it was, I, I'm not a coder, but uh, Bill, my business partner, he's in charge of the coding, and uh, but it's it's more than the coding. It's, and we heard, and we heard this from multiple uh, people that when we started out, many people didn't think we would ever succeed because, and the reason was, um, 
connecting on one platform, on one system, a huge between workers, groomers, trainers, all the way to veterinarians, specialists, neurosurgeons, oncologists, hospitals, all the way through shelters and everything. It's a, that was the, co the code we had to crack. How to build a platform that will talk to everybody, not leave everybody out, and everybody will feel comfortable on it. Mm -hmm. And that was, that's really the trade secret that many other people couldn't figure out, and we managed to solve that problem. And that's where the majority of the time went. Not in coding it, but in yep. figuring out what to do. Yep, that makes sense. Uh, so where's MRR at these days? Um, so at the moment, I mean, uh, the MRR is, is relatively low, but that's on purpose because much like Reddit and WhatsApp and many other platforms that uh, didn't charge initially until it grew to a very fast user uh, base, that's what we're doing. Um, we believe that over the next four to five years, the pet market, just like every other market that millennials and the younger generations have taken over, have moved to be platforms and platform uh, owned. Um, and you can take every sector of life. You know, it has four or five mega platforms that rule it. We believe the global pet ecosystem will move in the same direction. And yep. we're, we're targeting being one of those mega platforms. So at the moment, it's all about user, uh, user adoption and, and utilization of the system. So your year-over-year -year growth rate in user adoption now, because you're what I think you said 18 months you've been onboarding users. Yep. So would you know what the year-over-year -year growth rate is? Yep, I can tell. Actually, I have it right here. <laughs> so um, over the last 18 months, we grew 480 percent in pets on the platform. We okay. grew over 370 percent in pet businesses and over 780 percent in uh, clinics on the platform That's in a year and a half. And we're going to talk about the growth strategies that are leading to that in a minute. I've just got a couple more questions. Uh, do you have employees? And if so, how many do you have? 16 amazing employees, all in the U.S. Um, we're a work from home company by design. Yep. And we have people spread out from New Hampshire to New Orleans and through Texas, Kansas, Missouri, all the way to uh, Washington State and the West Coast. And how much have you raised so far? We've raised nine and a half million over five years. And where'd that money come from for the most part? Was it VCs, private equity, friends and family? No, 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 no. It was mostly angels, super angels and family offices. Okay. Um, before we transition on to the portion of our interview where we're going to talk about growth and how you're attracting all those people, I would like to close out this portion with uh, asking you this. What advice would you give to other SaaS founders who are in the midst of raising capital or thinking about raising capital? Um, I would say two things first and foremost. I would say don't be blinded by love of the product. Keep your eyes on the market. I've seen too many companies and too many people who have basically been so in love with their product that they didn't notice feedback from the market on what's working, what's not working, and if they need to change pivot or anything. Successful company out there that you've seen are companies where the founders or the management team has been able to be nimble, adapt, and put, sometimes even pivot on the base product to meet it to what the market is telling them. When you're just stubbornly focused on, on product because you, you're so in love with it and with the idea, that you know, tends to be a problem and a, a, that's a big risk. Um, and investors have a very keen eye on figuring that out. And, you know, in the initial interviews, if the investors feel that out from, or get that impression, you can be in, very challenged in raising money. The second thing I would say is hire by talent. Um, you're not rich enough to pay cheap. And in many, many cases, when you hire cheap, you end up paying twice because you don't get time to market, you don't get quality, you don't get a lot of that. And any investor who will start doing due diligence on your team, especially the sophisticated investors, will 
immediately figure out how talented the team is, how much internal politics, how much well they're you know, working together as a cohesive team or not. And if you get that wrong, I would say KISK investment could buy. I mean, nobody will invest in a company that has a potential of uh, blowing up internally because of politics and, and lack of professionalism. Good advice. Okay, let's talk about growth. Tell me about your uh, user acquisition systems. So with the pet parents, um, we're focusing specifically on the millennials. And as we all know from other aspects, millennials um, work, live, and think in a different way. I'm 53 years old and what my generation did. I mean, they, you know, they stream TV, they don't have cable TV, by, by and large, they look at Reddit versus uh, you know, the Wall Street Journal or paper, mm -hmm. at least, and that kind of. So the whole marketing efforts have to be targeted to the specific market that you're going after. We're, we're marketing to the, to the uh, B2C uh, consumers through digital marketing. Instagram, Facebook, Google Ads, you know, all those digital marketing capabilities. We're not doing TV ads. We're not doing paper ads. We're not doing uh, billboards. We're not doing everything which was used to be the staple, you know, 15 years ago. So of the digital stuff, which is, which is giving you the greatest ROI right now? I would say mostly Instagram uh, and Google Ads, and we're getting to a, a CAC, a cost of acquisition of about a dollar forty per user, which is really, really low. Do you have any competitor metrics or any way of knowing that a dollar forty is going to work for you in the long term? Have you modeled that out already, or how do you? We have. Well, we have, and it depends on which platform you're on. But you know, most platforms show that companies, SaaS uh, um, companies, um, they are. CAC needs to be somewhere between a dollar to three dollars, depending on what the company is and what the value is, and you know what the if it's in healthcare or it's in um, e-commerce or it's in different kind of stuff. But we're right in the middle of where we should be. Um, we look at it slightly differently because with a monthly subscription cost of two and a half dollars for a consumer which any consumer would pay for, you know, unlimited 24-7 vet hotline and lost and found service and that kind of stuff. Can, you know, compare that to a buck 41 of acquisition cost, that's an ROI of less than a month. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's fantastic. Um, how much churn do you have right now? So, um, we're not sure exactly because... Our growth rate has been so high that it's hard to figure out how many people are dropping off. Um, I can tell you, for example, that a month ago, we had over 1.6 million sessions on the platform. This month, we've had over 1.85 million sessions on the platform. That's an average of over six sessions per pet per month, uh, which is a lot. I mean, think of yourself about platforms that you use. Mm -hmm. How many of those do you, you know, log in and do something six times a month? So the current growth rate in the current economic conditions of the COVID-19 and everything else is not a standard situation going forward, right? I mean, there's everybody's using now teleservices because of the situation. The big question will be what will happen post-pandemic? How many will stay on? How many will drop off? And what will be the um, situation? So at the moment, it's, I wouldn't say it's a telltale for what's going to happen down the line. Yeah. We'll have to maybe do an update with you later on. <laughs> I'm just trying to be honest. <laughs> so you did, I want to go back just a minute because you mentioned to me that Instagram was the best marketing activity and, and my, my audience wouldn't let me off the hook if I didn't go down that rabbit hole a little bit. So do you happen to know what it is on Instagram that you're doing that's working so well? Yep. I would say it's carousel ads. So it's we're doing... Car it's something called carousel ads. So it's a type carousel of ad. ads. Carousel ads. Yeah. Accent. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so those are really, really, really working well. And when you compare or you when you connect those with very targeted marketing about people who are interested in pets or in any kind of you know a laundry list of tag words that we use that people are interested in, it works well. We have a we work with um, external 
marketing firms uh, who do specific digital marketing. That's their expertise. And they build those ads for us and they help us uh, manage those campaigns. And, you know, it's working. At the end of the month, we're rolling out new affiliate marketing programs where we're going with um, influencers and uh, people mm -hmm. uh, like that. Uh, blog posts, influencers, uh, people, you know, in, in affiliate, classic affiliate marketing programs, which we will, we will believe will be highly successful as well. But it's the combination of the visual and the marketing asset built in a very specific way to meet, uh, you know, the, uh, the target market and then targeting it to a very specific set of people based on their, um, you know, interests on, on where they lie in order to get the best uh, return. Are you sending, so let's talk about a specific Instagram carousel ad. Are you sending that traffic directly to your homepage or do you have specific landing or do you have landing pages that are each optimized to different audiences? What does that look like? We have both. It depends on what, uh, what the ad is. So for example, now we're running an ad for the uh, veterinary hotline, right? Mm -hmm. People are at home, people uh, are worried, something happens to the pet, they need to have a uh, answer. In many cases, the clinics are shut down because of essential or non-essential business, whatever, right? Yep. So um, we're targeting people to go to a certain specific landing page where they can get all the information they need and sign up from that landing page. In other cases, where it's more informative ads about the value of the platform and the app by itself, there's no landing page, but it's you know, specifically an ad that talks about the value, and then you can go to the App Store and download the app or Google Play Store, whatever. So it depends. We, you know, we're not fixated on only one methodology. It, it dep we need to adapt according to the case in order to be nimble. Okay. So when we're done our recording, my system's going to send you an email asking you for links to anything that we've talked about. If you feel like sharing any screenshots of ads and the links that those ads are going to, I would love to include those in the show. Love to. I'll send them over, of course. Okay. Um, so do you, do you have a sense yet of customer LTV? Uh, no, to be honest, not yet. Yeah. Uh, not yet. What I can tell you is that uh, we haven't seen a lot of um, drop-off. Uh, I mean, we've seen, if you look at the classic, you know, utilizations over a lifetime per uh, user, they haven't been drastically dropping off. And actually the usage on the platform has been going in a major way, way faster than the amount of users that are joining the platform. Um, for example, I just studied that, you know, in, in the last two weeks, we grew by 11% from 1.6 million to 1.85 million sessions on the platform. That's a growth of way above and beyond the amount of new pets that joined the platform. So, but again, like I said, it, it depends on, at the moment, because of the COVID-19 situation and mm -hmm. because it's an outlier uh, and it's been going on for the last two months or whatever, we're not trying to do deductions from this because that's not the standard uh, yeah. time frame and it's, it's going to skew up a lot of measurements. So I want to talk a little bit about customer success. So uh, back in episode 315 of my podcast, I interviewed the founder of, a, of a, an app called Jivo Chat. And he, they're an app that they make extensive use of an internal sales team to convert freemium users very successfully to paid users. So we're going to call that sales led growth. Then there's other companies out there that are focusing more on product led growth, which obviously can be less expensive to do if you can get your app to be your salesperson for you. And the onboarding experience I think is a, has a lot to do with uh, a whole bunch of metrics that are really important to pay attention to. So would you say, I guess it's a two part question. I'm going to guess with you, you're more product led growth than sales led growth. Um, and then if that's true, which I suspect that it is, can you tell me about the onboarding experience and are there things that you've tried that didn't work out and are there things that you've implemented recently that have really, you know, kind of shot the ball out of the park, so to speak? Yeah. So we are product led growth and the way we do it, we utilize a marketing cloud and systems like that, you know, from Salesforce where we go back 
to the users, the people who've downloaded the app on a periodic basis and say, hey, have you noticed the app can, only, can also enable you to do this? Hey, have you noticed you can also do that? And we expose them to more and more and more features that they are able to do on the platform on a ongoing messaging capability or, or outreach. And that's been working really, really well because, um, because it's a platform and not just an app. Sometimes people just look at the initial capability because when you sign up, all you need to do is put in your name, your uh, email, your pet's name, and you're good to go. But much like on LinkedIn and many other things, you have this small little kind of uh, clock that shows you what percentage of your profile has been done mm -hmm. and you go from zero to 100. So we slowly push people you know, to enabling more and more pieces of their profile because I'll give an example. Hey, you can, you can choose the food and add the food that you provide to your pet. That will enable you to also watch their weight and share that information with your vet, with your border, with you know, your kennel, with whomever you need to share that information with and will enable you to look at a whole other set of capabilities like wellness, like ease of use, like all kinds of stuff like that. Or, hey, you can add, you can ask your vet to add your vaccinations into the system and that gets populated into the app, that will make your life way easier when you go to the groomer or you go to board your dog or you go to people like that that need your proof of vaccination, otherwise they won't take care of your pet. So we use product capabilities inside the system in order to expose them more and more and more piece by piece to the users in order to get them to use the system more and more. And again, because the basic app is free, it doesn't cost them anything and it's just more usability and it makes it, makes it more sticky. Have you been able to, and, and if I missed it because I was writing notes for our show notes, apologize, um, but have you been able to incorporate any level of virality into the app where one user signs on and it really benefits them. You know, like when you go on Facebook, they're saying like, add your friends, you on LinkedIn, add your connections yep. to get other people to start to come into your community or come into that community. Have you had any success with that? And, and like I say, I apologize if you already explained it because I was writing notes. Yeah, no, no. So I can tell you that we have, we have a uh, mostly on the B2B2C perspective. Mm -hmm. So where businesses, groomers, workers, vets, trainers um, are adding their end clients onto the system because they want those people to download the app in order to be able to interact and do a lot of different capabilities that they don't have to do, but if they do, it, it makes everybody's life way, way easier. And what mm -hmm. we've started to see now is B2C to B, where basically users, consumers, are going to their service providers, <coughs> excuse me, and asking them to, <coughs> excuse me, asking them to um, um, use the portal in order to enable all kinds of capabilities from, hey, instead of me having to chase after you for appointments, mm -hmm. why don't you just use the bubble bark you know, system so I can see exactly when you have free time and I can schedule it on your calendar? Or, hey, why don't you do this? Or, hey, why don't you do that? So we're seeing a significant growth, mostly in B2B2C, but also starting in B2C to B, which is something that we had always hoped for, but never really expected to happen so quickly. Okay. So now we want to transition into the last phase of the interview, interview where we're going to talk about leadership principles and people. Um, and my first question there is, have standard operating procedures been developed in your organization? Are you documenting your processes? And if so, how has that impacted the operations? The answer is yes, obviously, um, but bear in mind we're a startup, and I think the biggest difference mm -hmm. between a startup and a large uh, corporation, and I come from, you know, I was in a, a VP operations of a, bill, of a large billing company, Bill worked at Microsoft, so we, we have the experience on both, and I think the biggest difference is if you go outside process lines in a large organization, you're going to get slapped. If you stay inside process lines in a startup, you're going to get slapped. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the uh, virtues, in my opinion, of a startup. But yes, we have processes. So on the development side, we have very clear development processes 
with everything from you know, the agiles and sprints and all the rest of the uh, keywords and a documented um, coding of what, what's happening and where and how it's done and the logic and everything else. So that if somebody gets hit by a truck, God forbid, we can pick up where we left off without losing any valuable information. On the operation side, we have very clear procedures of account management, what you do, how you do, where you do it, Salesforce, how do you manage it, what we use, how we use Salesforce in difference to other companies, mm -hmm. what we do with it, and so forth and so forth. So there's a very clear process, onboarding a new client. If it's a vet, what's the process to onboard the, the vet? What's the emails that go out? What links do they get? When do you touch them? All that kind of stuff. If it's a groomer, it's a whole different onboarding process because there's a different level of need and different feature attributes that the you groomer uses versus the vet. So all of those are happening and all of that is uh, documented with all the regular platforms from Jira to Salesforce and everything in between. So where does all the content for your SOPs live? Are they so, box or are they where? Uh, mostly it's on Google Drive. So we have a, a company, Google Drive, uh, where the majority live. But then we also have the, ex the additional um, um, systems like, uh, you know, Jira, like uh, Salesforce that, you know, they're not actually the process documents, mm -hmm. but where a, a lot of the processes rely on those systems yep. for different uh, parts. Yep. Okay. Uh, you'd mentioned to me, I think 14 employees, is that right? Did I 16. That? 16. So what's the division between sales, marketing, and engineering of those 16 people? Nine are engineering. Okay. Um, we have four in uh, sales, say, excuse me, five in sales and marketing, nine are in engineering, and then there's uh, Bill and uh, myself. Okay. And are you hiring much right now? or you got all you need for the time being? For the time being, we have everything we need. Um, we expect to need to hire another four to five people by the end of the year, but that depends on if the growth continues the way it is at the moment, then we'll have to hire yeah. another four or five people. What system, tell me about your systems that you use to uh, recruit, to find the right people to put on the bus. So we have found LinkedIn to be the most effective one in addition to a friend bringing friend, word of mouth. So you don't, so to be clear then, you're using LinkedIn as a recruiting tool. You're not so much posting a job and just having a barrage of resumes come in. You're outgoing with exactly. the user pointer saying, what about you, what about you, what about you? Well, yeah, LinkedIn has a recruiting. I mean, you can use it in many different ways. Obviously the most simple one is just posting a, a job position and waiting for the avalanche to come. But uh, no, we're working with an account manager in LinkedIn where we're utilizing them as an actual recruiting platform. They have pretty good services over there. What are these, what does LinkedIn charge you to do that? Say again, you were cut off. Yeah, what does LinkedIn charge you to yep, use your you. recruiting service? Oh, hold on, I can't hear you. So it's several hundred dollars on a monthly basis. It's a subscription, uh, depending on which part of the services you utilize and what you sign up for. We've had to use it at different levels according to different people that we were looking for. So for example, we had a much tougher time, more challenging time finding a good backend developer versus an account manager. So it depends on the level of effort and the, how complex it is for that specific job. And that's the level of services that we need uh, to pay for. Okay. Uh, what about the interview process? What does that look like for you? So it's the initial hiring manager. Then it's usually two additional managers. So if it's a team lead and then it's the CTO, and then in addition, it's a uh, bill who's kind of our head of uh, product and head of strategy versus if it's an account manager, then it's the head of account management. And then it's usually myself and one of the salespeople because those are the people they need to interact with and to get a second opinion on. And when you're actually conducting these interviews, are you following a structured process for the interview or are you just seeing, Hey, does this person feel good? Feel like they're going to be a fit? Like what, what determines an interview went well? from an interview, or sorry, what determines an interview went well from an interview went spectacular? So 
We have a certain framework. I wouldn't say it's necessarily a process, but it's a framework. Obviously, understanding the background, understanding what their expertise is like, all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, being a small startup and being a remote location startup, where you don't have the person sitting in a table uh, next to you where you can keep an eye on, it comes down to chemistry and to instinct. And I would say a lot to um, management experience. Mm -hmm. So Rob Christensen, our CTO, uh, you know, very, very experienced guy, Bill and myself, both in our 50s, you know, relatively experienced as well, you know, given the age and, uh, and everything else. So it comes down a lot to that because you could have somebody who's a perfect fit from the technical perspective, but you don't get the warm and fuzzy that mm -hmm. they would be able to work independently, remotely, <clears throat> and interact only via Slack. While you might have somebody else who might only be like an 80% fit from the technical uh, perspective, but you get an extreme warm and fuzzy that, you know, he's, you know, it's like a glove to a hand from mm -hmm. the, the, the company culture and from how he's going to be working independently, remotely. So it, it all depends. It's, it's not a, you know, checkbox that he has to be a hundred percent technical uh, uh, fit and hundred, it, it comes down to, What's your gut feeling, how they'll fit? And that's why you have at least two senior people, the head of the group, CTO, head of account management, whatever, and then either Bill or myself, though, because it comes down to a discussion between the two of us, what do we feel about that specific candidate? All right, and then we're gonna finish up with this last question. What haven't I asked you that if you were interviewing yourself that you think would make this an even better interview? What haven't you <clears throat> asked me? Mm -hmm. I would say that as a starter, as an entrepreneur, CEO of a startup in a very challenging time and in a, a remote location, how do you make it work? Mm -hmm. How do you make it click? And what I would answer is that you need to remember, a manager needs to remember that their job is not to do their employees' jobs. Their job is to open the roadblocks and let their team soar. If I cannot provide the runway to let my team spread their wings and take off, they're gonna go down and I'm gonna go down with them as well. And I think that many times, especially in challenging times like we have today, especially when you don't necessarily see the team around you all day long, people get a little bit defensive and try to have their fingers in, in everything and that creates a bad situation. You mm -hmm. need to trust the people that you hired. You need to trust them that they know how to do their job. You need to enable the runway, both financially and roadblocks from internal politics to anything else. You know, make sure there's no roadblocks and then your team will soar. And when they soar, the company soars and that comes back to you. Absolutely, amen. The thing that I, uh, and I'll, I'll put my two cents into that, I agree with everything that you said. And the thing for, in our case, um, you'll notice there's a plaque over my shoulder. We have yep. the 254th spot in the Inc. 5000 in a company where I don't even have a day-to-day -day role any longer because we did what you just said. And we made sure that there was a foundation of really great SOPs in place that, that predominantly I wrote. And then I said to the team, it's up to you to take what I've written and improve it and iterate it on an ongoing basis. And you'll always be able to then have these great systems to rely on. So that if one of those people were to leave and we've had a very small amount of turnover, you're able to put someone else into that seat and they're able to essentially pick up right where the other person left off because the other person was continually refining those documents um, and that was one of the challenges we had early on when we had our documents in Google versus in our own software. Um, that's what Flowster is. It's a workflow management application. It forces people to rely on the software, which in turn forces them to keep the SOPs up to date on an ongoing basis versus in Google. It's easy. They're just kind of over there and you can sort of forget, depending on what other process maybe you've built in. Yep. Um, but it's, uh, anyway, for us, it was, it was a big, that's kind of why I founded the software company. It was a huge game changer for us. Yep. I totally agree.
So thank you very much for making some time to come and be on the show. It's been a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much. My pleasure.